Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and today we have a very special episode. We have Trainer Road in Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Hello. And then Chad and Nate have the day off. Instead, we actually have a special guest with us, pro cyclist, or I should say retired pro cyclist, Ben Jacques Mains. How you doing, Ben? I'm great. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're excited to have you on uh, because we're going to have a bit of a different episode here. Both of you, uh, Amber and Ben, uh, pro cyclists, American pro cyclists as well. Um, Amber raced over in, in Europe primarily throughout the, a good portion of her career. Uh, ben, you raced in America for a large portion of your career, but you've raced internationally as well. So we've got some cool perspectives. We're going to dig into a lot of different things that come down to like motivation. And even though you're pro athletes, I bet we can get a whole lot of points of relevance out of this. All of us listening to this motivation, mm -hmm. how to manage your relationship with training and cycling in general and just different things you've learned. So I think it's going to be a great episode. Uh, before we jump into it, though, just a couple things. Head over to trainerroad.com. That's probably the best thing you can do to help this podcast. We appreciate it. You can submit your podcast at trainerroad.com slash podcast. You can check out Plan Builder and Build a Plan at uh, trainerroad.com. If you go on there, you can see it there. Uh, you can use the strength training calculator to figure things out. Plenty of stuff. And we have a couple job postings that I wanted to mention. First is for a brand designer. Uh, so you can go to trainerroad.com slash jobs to see these, and you can even subscribe to an RSS there. So then you don't miss it when we post new jobs, but, uh, a brand designer, and then also a video editor, uh, the, both of those jobs are remote. Um, so, or they can be remote, especially these days when we're uh, talking about how everything's changed. And as you can see, we're all here on zoom. Uh, so they're remote opportunities. They can, they'd be awesome. We'd love for you to apply. Uh, just go over to trainerroad.com slash jobs. The other thing that I want to mention too, is that if you want early access to our new iOS app, which it is awesome. If you follow me on Instagram or anything else, you can see where I've been sharing my rides and it looks really cool because it has an automatic sharing function. That's one of the absolutely many things that are built into the app. In fact, yesterday I even found a new feature that I had no clue existed and spoke to one of our engineers. He's like, oh yeah, I built that in there. So tons of new stuff. Uh, it's really cool. If you want early access to it, go to trainerroadcom slash forum search for early access to iOS beta, uh, or if you just look up iOS beta, you'll be able to find information there. And then for those that have already applied for that, just know that we're kind of like rolling that out in waves and expanding the size there as time goes on. So if you have signed up, but you haven't received anything about like uh, testing the app quite yet, it's just because we're still rolling it out and we'll get to you eventually as we roll out and expand the testing pool size. So that's the stuff out of the way there. Head over to trainerun.com, please do it. Ben, I'm going to intro you properly here and, and, and talk about you uh, and give you a chance to blush. So, uh, first of all, you competed professionally from 2002, uh, to 2015, and we'll get into your whole background and in, in further detail, but you did so for this year, Nevada Cannondale team, Bissell and Jameis Hoggins Berman's team. So those are teams that are like, um, notable and very recognized teams for anybody that follows us racing here. You were selected 10 times to ride the tour of California, which is fascinating and, and super impressive to see a top 10 finishes at the tour to San Luis down in Argentina, Harold sun tour down, in, uh, down in Australia tour of the Batten kill cascade cycling classic and the tour of Missouri, the climbing classification winner, or AKA like polka dot Jersey for the tour, same concept applied to other races at tour of Utah and the USA pro challenge. Podium overall finish in the 2007 NRC, which was basically at that point, that was the predominant racing calendar that you saw here in the United States. So it was the uh, akin to like what you see for UCI overall ranking when you see for that sort of thing or UCI world cup rankings, stuff like that. That was uh, for basically the North American race series that were going on. That was, that was the overall series. Super impressive there finished second. And then this is a fun one for me. Cause this is a one that's close to home for us, but you finished second at the Nevada city classic, which is an extremely difficult criterium course out of a three man breakaway with Lance Armstrong and Levi Leipheimer, which, uh, you know, those guys, uh, maybe we've heard of them before. Super impressive. So, so Ben, thank you for coming on, uh, looking at your Palmares there. It seems like you're a climber. Was that the case or like, how did you kind of develop to become the cyclist you were? And what was that cyclist? Like, yeah, you'd think I'd be a climber, but <laughs> I mean, I'm six one. Um, when I was racing, I was, you know, 165, 170 pounds. Um, that was like, uh, climbing is not really my thing. Um, I'm a good time trialer. Um, I won bunch sprints before. Um, like I ride with high power. Um, basically I've, my training turned into 
ride everything like it's flat ground, including the climbs. And it worked out for me um, overall my career. Just leave the power on is how it turned out to be. I, I thinking of that, like that's the rider. I think that's the rider I want to be a rider that rides with power and is able to keep it on. So, so that's Get the power <laughs> that, that was kind of like, kind of like you too, though. Right. Amber, I would assume in, in your career. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, definitely, um, similarly, I was a, a bigger rider. So the advantage was power, like just absolute power wattage, um, and, surprisingly you can get over some, some big and steep climbs when you have a lot of Watts. Yeah. It's funny. That's like one of the things that, um, so we, we, I, I get, I get flack all the time for mentioning Keegan Swenson too much on this podcast, but he's a relatively smaller, he's a small person, but he, I believe one of the key things in terms of him becoming more dominant over the past couple of years has been learning to ride with more power, more consistently like that. Like, mm -hmm his physiology, when you look at it, you're like, oh, he must be a climber and he climbs extremely fast. It's true. But where he really kind of separates himself, I think is because he rides with the throttle down just more often. It's less yeah. off and on. And it's just more constant in that sweet spot zone kind of really, you know, like that's where he sits. Uh, ben, how did you get started in your career? Let's uh, like, even before your career, how did you get started in cycling and decide that you wanted to make it a career? Um, so I grew up mountain biking as a teenager and this was like the heyday of mountain biking, like the, the early mid nineties, you know, it was like the biggest thing ever is like, I want to be a pro mountain biker. It's going to be amazing. And when I was 20, I got a pro license and I was a pro mountain biker for two years before I ever even owned a road bike. Um, wow. I got into cyclocross in college. Um, I, started riding that around, jump in the group rides. And um, I raced all around the country, mountain biking, um, never was really good. I could win like the local races, but again, like riding with sea level power at all these altitude mountain bike races, um, I was getting my butt kicked at <laughs> Northern Nationals at altitude, going to Colorado, going to Mammoth and Big Bear here in California. Um, and so I just transitioned to the road um, immediately lost a bunch of weight, um, just inherently all the muscle mass drained off of me riding hundred mile days instead of, you know, 25 to 40 mile days mm -hmm. on, on the mountain bike uh, made a big difference. Um, physiologically, I just, I learned that ride hard all the time thing from mountain biking. And I picked up the tactics of road racing pretty quickly. So it made that really work for me. And that transition happened pretty easily. If I um, could I ask, up, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. I ended up riding the very first um, San Francisco Grand Prix as a guest rider. This was in 2001. And um, that got me um, noticed by some of the many um, new pro teams that were coming out that next year. And, uh, and I signed for Sierra Nevada and I raced for them for the first five years of my career. I want to ask one question about something you said there that that ride hard all the time thing that you picked up from mountain biking. Can you explain kind of what that is and, and, and what that was like in terms of the output that you would have on a bike and how that would be different than maybe somebody is thinking of how they ride. Right. One of the biggest pieces of advice I got from my, one of my first road teammates, um, this was during riding cat one, cat two races was like, I'm strong. And they saw that they make sure that if you're going hard, that everyone else is going hard too. like as a mountain biker, like it's very easy to like want to just race and like, Oh, there's a hill. I'm going to go like that. Make, make it count, like make that effort count. If you're going to go hard, make sure everyone else is working. So attack, make them chase you. If you got to go do that and lots of mistakes along the way and like learning the, the whole figuring out the road racing thing, but I, I made mistakes and then I didn't make that same mistake again. Um, yeah. I picked it up pretty quickly. So that's like, uh, uh, that's, that's the problem that I find myself falling into way too many times whenever, especially like beginning of the year when I'm just getting back into road events, I'm sure. And it's not like, it's probably not just inherently a mountain bike thing. It's probably an all of us thing in the sense that we, we like, we feel really good because we're riding hard, but then we realize like everybody else at that point in time is just going really easy. And, and it's, it's yeah. not that you have to be a lot faster than everybody else. 
It's just, you have to have the right timing, right? Because, <laughs> because you just have to find the moment when everybody else has just worked enough so that your hard is really hard for everybody else instead of your hard being easy. Right. Well, I found, especially as my career progressed and I would do the local races, a lot of people just wanted to follow me around. So I had to select which races I showed up at by, you know, this course needs to be hard enough that just riding the course is so difficult that people can't hang on my wheel. And I ended up riding, I don't know if, how much of the, the fan base is from NorCal, but I ended up riding Pescadero Road Race and Copperopolis Road Race by myself a lot. Um, yeah. cause I would just ride away from people and have 60 more miles to go. Those are really hard races for those that don't know They're they're really like the, the profile in Pescadero is extremely challenging. It's a lot up <laughs> and, and, mm -hmm. and the ups are hard and same thing with Copperopolis. And it's also, I don't know if when you did it back then the pavement was, I mean, it's still, the pavement's Terrible. really bad. Terrible. So <laughs> because of that too, if you're the sort of rider that has a uh, lower FTP, that really rough pavement kind of, uh, imagine it, it kind of takes 30 watts away from everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a 300 watt threshold versus if you have a 200 watt threshold, that 30 watts is gonna hurt that 200 watt rider a whole lot more um, yep. versus the, the 300 watt rider. A Amber, did you ever have that too? That's kind of like an interesting thing talking about a pro rider coming back to like local races or kind of like being the big fish in a small pond sort of a thing. Does that change the way you race? It, it, it does. Cause often you're the marked rider and it's usually the, I mean, it's often also the case that you don't necessarily have teammates. So it's not like you have your whole full pro team there to work with you. And I was just getting started in cycling around this time. And I was in the same area as Ben and Ben was an absolute legend. Like <laughs> it's no wonder to me that he was marked, you know, in every race that he did. And it, it actually, it honestly never occurred to me to pick races like that, that would, you know, really make it more difficult for people to, uh, you know, local teams to gang up on you as, as the one pro in the field or one of the solo pros in the field. Uh, but absolutely been crushed <laughs> and <laughs> you were, you were one of those riders that I really looked up to because not only were you phenomenal on the bike, but just also a really classy, good person. Um, so I really appreciated having you as a role model out there. And, uh, I totally get why you would <laughs> <laughs> have to cherry pick your races because no one was going to let Ben go up the road unless they absolutely couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> what would you dif What would you do differently from a tactical perspective other than picking a hard course, Ben? Like, is there anything when you're out on the course, when you're a marked rider that you do differently than when you're not marked? Um, I would be constantly paying attention to the situation on the road and not be afraid to take advantage of a situation at any point of the race. You know, if it's if it's a five lap race and you're doing 20 mile laps, you know, I'm not afraid to go on the attack on the second lap and then people are following me and not wanting to pull through. It's like, I'll attack again. And I'm, yeah, I'll end up solo or one guy goes with me and I talk him into working with me until he dies. Um, like that, you just don't, don't be afraid. And I'm also there to like get a pretty killer workout you know, I, I need to, I need to make it hard myself because the pace of the pro races, like on the national scene and then the UCI pro races, um, like the tour of Missouri tour of Georgia back then now tour of California. Um, th those races are so much faster and just riding it around in the pack is harder than, you know, the, the fast lined out paces of, um, of the local stuff. Yeah. 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 That's a problem most I, of us probably don't have to experience. <laughs> Sorry, Amber. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. I just wanted to follow up on something. So, you know, that you're describing like a really clear difference between the tactical approach of mountain biking and road biking. Biking. Um, did you find that there was a big difference in even like your, your mental perspective from transitioning out of mountain biking and contrasting what your mental framework was in mountain biking versus road biking? God, that was so long ago. I don't even really remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I, I was a pro mountain biker and I knew what it was like to race at the front of those races. And then, but every road race I'd go to, I'd be pack fill or I would think I'm pack fill. And then I still collect money at the end for placing seven. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's what got me into road racing because I could actually race all weekend and come home with some money. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I don't really remember what it was like. You know, mountain biking, it's, it's very one-on-one. -on -one. You're whatever your actual situation, whether you're racing at the front, it's you and like one other guy. It was very rare to have it be, you know, a big group where I got to think about sprinting people or setting up for the bottleneck and single track and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Road racing, it's all you're thinking about. You're in the Zen state of like, you know, I'm, I'm riding for 80 miles of just waiting to drop the hammer on people. And, you know, yeah, I'm excited. I know I'm fit. I know I'm, I have it, but I can't show it off. I actually need to kind of play hooky and like ride in the back and be anonymous and have people not thinking about me until it's too late. Um, so mm -hmm. it, working on like the, those tactics, like I said, I learned the mistakes really early and then I thought that I was always pretty tactically astute and I won some pretty good races that way, taking on like a full team of guys and working them over one by one. <laughs> um, and I also was lucky to have really tactically astute teammates as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there was a time point when they, we had radios and they took them away. I think that was like the 08 season, something like that. And there's like the first half the year, like these teams, like good teams, good riders had really had to figure out how to race together again and mm -hmm. not have a voice in their ear, feeding them information, telling them this is the current race situation. There's an attack that's gone and we need to cover it. Like you actually have to be looking, you have to be able to recognize on the fly what's going on. And mm -hmm. I was fortunate to have teammates who were also in that same mode of like reading that race and figuring it out. And yeah, we won a bunch of races that way by just putting ourselves in a really good tactical position and racing positively moving forward in up the road instead of sitting and waiting and hoping that someone else handles the work for us. Thinking back, so looking at your career, you rode for Sierra Nevada for, for quite a few years and then thereafter went to Bissell and Bissell was like a staple in, in the American road racing scene for so long, right? Um, it, throughout that process, you also, at some point, uh, you, you, you had kids as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to take a quick moment to tell, and, and th by the way, that's what we can hear in the background, um, by the way. So, uh, Ben, Ben's kids, I'm sure having breakfast and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm sure you all understand listening to this. This is 2020. We're all at zoom, zoom from home. So, uh, but Ben, how did that change things for you? Be so, because there's professional cycling, which I believe that there are probably some misunderstandings about the focused nature of professional cycling, meaning that all you have to do is just get out of your bed and pedal your bike and then go back into your bed. Uh, but at the same time, there are also some athletes that then have to deal with uh, additional responsibilities like having kids and everything else. Did that change? How did that priority switch change your training as a professional athlete or change your outlook? I think it is a lot deeper than what you just said. It's not I, I recognize that, hey, just get out of bed and get this work done and then recover from that work. That was a big part of my life for decades. Um, but why do you get out of bed? Why do you get up and do what you do every day? It's a good question for anyone. But as soon as I had kids, I had a very clear vision as to why I was going to be, you know, working really hard today and then hit the couch and you know, play with my son and I will play cars and, you know, they, seeing his face every day, seeing my daughter when she was first born, like that was, it was a huge turning point in my career because I had all this external motivation that made me want to get out and go and at the local races, sprint for that preen. Like that's, I need diaper money. Like we got to make this work, you know, or, or I got to quit cycling and do something. I could do anything. I have a, two college degrees. I could probably do anything that would pay more than pro cycling. Um, <laughs> but I like cycling and I want to make this work for me. So how do I do that? You find the motivation that really lights the fire under you. Um, I, going going back to that sierra nevada phase i learned all these lessons along the way of like how do i like the mechanisms you know how do i train properly how do i approach my nutrition how do i approach my recovery and sleep 
and I really got those. And also, how do I race as a team, like when I'm out on the road? But this whole time period, I'm like waiting and thinking and like, I have flashes of brilliance, but like I couldn't really put it together as to like why things weren't clicking all the time. And then as soon as I had kids, it worked for hmm. the whole rest of the time. Um, so I think having that motivational component and like why you, why you do this, like, yes, you can love it, but as a hobby, that's one thing from as a job, that's a totally different thing where you have to get up and your paycheck depends on being able to put out good power. Um, mm. That can sap the fun and the, the things that made you start that can really sap that out of um, the equation. So finding something else that gets you up and gets you out every day, um, it's pretty helpful. <laughs> And so your why was more, it was, it was motivated behind the res additional responsibility and the love that you have for your family, right? Like it was less having kids as much as having that why, right? And that why was sufficient to be able to motivate you through because somebody else is listening to this that doesn't have kids like, like Amber, you didn't have kids. What, what, what was your why through your career? Cause I'm sure that, I mean, Amber, you, you trained at such a high level for so long because not just in bikes, but in swimming and everything else. And you've mentioned that with swimming, that the enjoyment dropped out of it for you. So how mm -hmm. did you, what did you find for your motivation to keep going as a pro athlete when you're living off in a foreign country, <laughs> isolated from so much that you know, all of those things, what was your motivation? It changed a lot. And I think that's something that I do have in common with Ben, which is that um, the motivation, I mean, we both had very long careers and at a point that range of time in your life is a time when you grow and change a lot as a person. Um, and so allowing, allowing the why to change, you know, whether that's year from year, year to year, or over the course of many years. Um, but it really changed a lot for me from the beginning to the end. I think in the beginning, I was scared of not reaching my potential. And so there was some element of fear. And I think that by the end, I was much more I was much more engaged in the process and enjoying mm -hmm. the growth, the personal growth that yeah. arose out of the process itself. And so it was less about getting <laughs> specific outcomes and results that I thought would mean that I was good enough or that I thought would mean that I'm reaching my potential or, or, or not reaching my potential. And it was more about engaging in the process and how is improving the process going to actually make me a better person? And is that, you know, at the same time as improving, improving outcomes, hopefully, and then, and then making me a better, better athlete. So I think that there's some commonality there too. I mean, for different reasons, obviously, and, and different circumstances, but, um, that, that evolution, I think is kind of inevitable when you race for that long. Hmm. Was it, and I, I assume you noticed that as well, uh, Ben, and that the motivation would uh, like kind of evolve. Did you have to, uh, and, and one question with that actually, so did you notice it evolving? Also, was it hard to accept a new motivation or leave behind an old one in any way, or was it just a natural process? Uh, it always evolves. Absolutely. I agree with Amber hundred percent on that. Um, you know, it, what got me into cycling is not what made me continue in cycling. It's not what made me finish my career um, 15 years later. You know, there's, there, it, your, your life is fluid. It's not like a, the 20 year old me and the 35 year old me had the same outlook on life. I sure hope not. <laughs> um, and anyone in that situation, you had better grow as, as you go through this whole process. Um, yeah. I mean, I, at the beginning I was like, I want to win. I want to like the, the goal with these like tiny little moments, but I, I learned really quickly like you race so much you race a hundred days, 150 days a year, like, yeah, you're going to lose a lot. <laughs> you got to be okay with that. Like you're like a, a good year is you win two or three races at the pro level. Oh, a great year where I doubled my contract. I won seven races. It's like, Whoa, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was great. I, I had a ton of podiums. So I was competitive the whole time. There's good reasons for, for everything that happened, but like looking at it like that, that initial goal, like, God, how disappointing 
would that have been if I had kept that as my original goal? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, like Amber, I think I really started enjoying the process and not getting caught up in finite details. And when you release that, those finite details, your motivation becomes a lot more fluid. Um, so I would show up to national championship level events, super relaxed, like, it, today's going to work out however it works out. Like it's out of my control. I'm going to affect the race as best I can and get on the podium of a couple of them. But I, 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 I've done all the homework and now I just need to perform, but stressing out about it is not going to help me. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it'll it's easier said than done, but it's really true. <laughs> <laughs> I found that like, So personally, I've been thinking through this just whether from the point of our discussion that we had prior to this podcast to even just now, I feel like when I first started out with mountain bike racing, because that was my first thing, I just, Mm -hmm. I just wanted to really ride fast on a bike and how fun that was. That Mm -hmm. was like, that was the motivation. And then once I started winning, I actually started to be motivated by the fear of losing. I was so afraid of losing like, Mm -hmm. and I, and I hated that concept so much that that drove me to train and to do everything. But that was super short lived because the fact is the more you race, the more you lose. Um, that's just the way it goes. Right. And then I think that it evolved from there very much toward being process oriented. So I wonder how consistent that is. If anybody's joining us now on YouTube or anything else can drop down a comment and let us know what your motivation is, because that would be interesting to see. And if that sort of evolutionary process is a common thread across people rather than just, you know, uh, uh, you two or perhaps us three here. So, cause that's, here's the thing. Um, if you're, whether you're paid to train or not, it's, it's not as if because you're paid to train, it's easy to just get out on the bike because you're paid to do it. Was, was that hard for you at some point in your career, Ben? Like, did you find yourself getting to the point where it was like hard to drag yourself out onto the bike or was that just a common occurrence? Uh, no, I was pretty good at staying motivated. Um, I also figured out what really works for me. Um, I would treat my daily training as a, um, a mental energetic flow, which sounds super hippy dippy, (laughs) um, but it, but it really worked for me. Like if it's a beautiful day out and you know, you're going to ride to the top of some mountain and it's three counties away and you're gonna have this killer view up there and see all the way to Sierra Nevadas and then ride all the way home. Like, and how many people got to do that on a Tuesday? Like Mm. that's a huge positive mental experience. And so I would like stock those up and like keep on racking those up until it was like 40 degrees, raining super hard, blowing sideways. It's like time to go spend some mental energy today. Like mm-hmm. I've been stocking up, I've been happy. I'm rec- it, it really made, made me realize and recognize that I'm happy and that I am enjoying what I'm doing. And so when there's days when it's like, yeah, this is probably not gonna be enjoyable, I can still find the motivation to get out and do that. Um, you also use it for the super hard workouts. And you know, I spent a lot of mental energy on VO max work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and race days, you know, it like when you gotta be tuned in and you're just like, you're super focused for hours on end, like it, it that's taxing, you know, uh, that's a, it's a, you rearrange your life around that kind of stuff um, mm. when you're competing so much. So, having that positive energetic flow was a big tool that I used on a daily basis to get through the hard parts. I really like that, Ben. And I think often what I hear from people is that there's this misconception that being disciplined, you know, that, okay, being at the highest level, like you need to be disciplined and that discipline is this really rigid practice of forcing yourself to go do horrible things that you really don't want to do. And it kind I mean, it has, it can have a pretty, I mean, although it's a, it's kind of a respected characteristic to be a disciplined person, it doesn't always have like a really positive connotation. And I love what you're saying, because it's really about finding discipline by banking happiness, Mm -hmm. which is a totally different way of looking at it. I think having 
the, the proper perspective and, and making sure that your daily experience is overall positive or you have the capacity to do it. Like, uh, yeah, you have to have discipline. You have to have your program. You have to have your details really sorted out, but you have to enjoy it. Like you, you cannot torture yourself into the ground and expect results or expect to perform when push really comes to shove. If you have left it all out on the road training, like how are you going to show up and be ready to actually want to do it? You got to be looking forward to the race that you've been training so hard for. So mm -hmm. how do you get to that place? I want to talk about another aspect of motivation because uh, so it's no secret that the time in which you were a pro cyclist, that was, you know, we're talking about the era and the sport in which we were all almost like the enlightenment era in the sense that we were becoming enlightened to the things that were going on in the sport. Yeah. Um, how is, how did you manage that sort of things from a motivation perspective in the sense that, cause I'm sure that you knew that you were racing against athletes who were doping. It wasn't that like you were, um, uh, I guess, uh, you were naive to the whole concept. I'm sure you knew. So, <laughs> knew. so how did you maintain motivation when you know that you're going up against those sort of odds and circumstances going into a race? That was a process there. I mean, it, it's, it's hard. Like you want to be angry. And I was angry for several years of my career, like at the beginning, like I had teammates test positive. I had competitors test positive. I had guys that I'd lost to multiple times test positive. So I was second to dopers, you know, I, I dozens of times in my career and then never got to stand on that podium. You know, I got the points and prize money added on a year, a year later. Like that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's hard to deal with when you, Con, or it's a constant barrage of that, especially if you're performing at a high level. You know that this guy that just danced away from you like it was nothing as you're on your limit, it's like, yeah, he's playing a different game. Like that, we're, we're not competing on, on the same level here. And that's hard to stomach. What I found, and I changed my perspective about it, was, and this was a motivational thing for me as well, all I can control is myself. All I can do is put myself out there as best as I can. I can train as hard as I can and get to a place where I can be happy with my performance on a given day. And this is also, I, I learned this earlier because of the constant losing that we were just talking about. Like you have to be able to deal with that. So if I'm constantly losing to, with anyone or dopers, or I don't really know at that on a given day, but I have to be happy with my performance on a given day. And if I mess up my tactics or I bonk or I forgot to eat or whatever happened in the race, I can be upset about those details under my control. Uh, but if someone else is better, like hats off to them. If they are better because they're doping, I can't control that either. And so I, I don't know if it's, uh, I, I, I learned to accept that there's too much that's happening that's out of my control. And, and also I learned that on my best days, I can beat them. And those wins are worth a lot more than those wins that they got over me. I can guarantee that because I never have to go back to my son and say, Hey, actually those wins that you saw, like, let me tell you about them and how it really happened. That's never going to happen. And I can always point at the trophy case that I have and the jerseys that I won and say, those are real, those count. And you know, the, I, I, I still can talk about it today. You know, those guys aren't talking about how their performances during that time and how they're proud of them. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. integrity is worth a lot <laughs> a lot it, 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 it's an interesting detail that you bring up about how the fact that if you are racing without integrity because of a situation like that and amber you're no you're no stranger to this as well in your career it's the same thing um when you're racing without integrity like that 
the consequences in all aspects of your life are so negative and, and they, and they, I guess it's not just as if like you dope and you win and everything is fantastic. I'm sure that a whole lot of guilt comes along with that and a whole lot of, uh, questioning as well. I can't imagine the, I can't imagine what, what people would carry with them. Maybe not, maybe they just have no remorse, but, um, <laughs> Amber, when, when you went through that, uh, your career as well, you came across plenty of athletes. I'm sure that were in, that, that were in situations like this. Would you have anything to add on that subject or, or do you have similar feelings to Ben? I think the way that Ben came around to it is probably the, the best place that you can, the best place you can land psychologically because it is maddening. And if you step back from that perspective, I mean, the fact is that this is a, it's a really hard sport. I mean, physically demanding, but also aside from everything on the bike, you are hustling every year for another contract. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're lucky enough to get a multi-year contract, great, but it's, it's never, you're constantly looking for that next contract. And, you know, to your point, Ben, to be granted a, a win a year or two later, because somebody tested positive, that doesn't, that doesn't make up for the lost salary in the last, in, you know, the intervening years that doesn't make right. up for not only contract opportunities, but other race co opportunities that might have been a door opening to another, even bigger contract. And when you're trying to make a living at this, that, that practical reality is, is very real. And I think that, um, it, it's overwhelming. So I think that, you know, focusing on what's within your control is, is probably the most constructive thing that you can do, uh, and, and to keep yourself just from, just from losing it all the time. Yeah. But also I think that as Ben was saying earlier, when you're connected to the process, there's a, there's more to it. And this is going to sound, uh, you know, professional racing wins absolutely matter, like I said, because they can open the door to contracts, but there is a lot more to it. And the integrity component is really important and the process component and how you're improving as a human being as much as how you're improving as an athlete. And um, absolutely, it, it is worth so much to me also to be able to say, I never once took in, you know performance enhancing drugs during my career ever and certainly ran across a lot of athletes who tested positive including teammates of mine and it's incredibly disappointing but again as in all things in life you really can only control yourself i want to tie in a point of relevance to this to us average athletes that so i have to remove the aspect of of like uh racing for a contract right um but for those of us that don't race pro uh we feel this sort of inequality uh, many times. And it's really frustrating. And I see podcast questions from you listening to this and, and it's hard because I want to answer every question, especially these sort of ones. But like some people will say like, I'm struggling with motivation because, you know, I work night shifts and I work two jobs or I, you know, I'm a single mom that's training and trying to do all this. And every time I show up to the races, there are these people that just don't have those responsibilities. And as a result, they have more training time and they have more opportunity, right? Because inequality, or there, there's absolute inequality of opportunity in terms of training time and in terms of fitness, genetics, plenty of different things, right? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to say that it's akin to doping at all. There's, there's a level of integrity there that, that brings that to a very different level uh, among other things as well. But for those of us listening to this and thinking, how does this apply to us? All of us face some sort of inequality with our competition. Like it, it's not as if everybody has a perfectly evil, even playing field, unless you just take drugs and, and for, so for, if you're listening to this, I think this is very important advice, maybe even advice that we've like understood and put into practice in other ways in our lives, but we've compartmentalized it from bike racing. Uh, and because it's competition, many times we feel that it should just kind of like, you know, be a different experience, but focusing in on what you control is is, is absolutely key. And it's really one of the best ways to get faster. I find that if you focus in on what you can control, you tend to increase your consistency. You tend to change around the different things in your life. You tend to optimize what needs to be optimized. And, and instead all that energy that you're talking about, Ben, you know, of, of putting into your training, instead of it going into ways where it's wasted, it goes toward productive ways. I, I want to transition to a point in your career where Ben, you like, you know, even though you're really tall, you had this pressure on you 
to to be like this super light climber and it led eventually you led to like an inflection point in your career so rather than me narrating what that is we should probably just uh, I, like you were kind of like i mean looking at it once again you're a climber in a lot of ways and you look at like the palmares but you're a really tall rider was that a pr external pressure were you just naturally a good climber how did you become a good climber and then we can go into how it evolved later on well, I think it all started in mountain biking. Like you ride with high power and you just, you're always going, right? So I took that mentality to road biking and just riding those big miles early. Like I said, I, 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 this is my mantra of the story of my career. I dropped out of college. I got a road bike. I dropped 20 pounds and the rest is history. <laughs> like it, it sounds easy. And honestly, it, it would, but, I had this huge engine and a lot of muscularity. And I was actually thinking about this since we talked last time, that muscularity and brute strength of mountain biking carried me for years. Like I still had that brute climbing strength as, as a basis for everything that I did. So even as I was working on my time trialing and being a good, ruler and could ride the front for my team, I would last way longer up climbs. I, I wouldn't, I, I would empty the tank or I'd feel like I was waxed on flat ground. And then we hit a climb and like I'd shift gears and feel great all of a sudden. And it was just this long-term baseline mountain biking muscularity, I think, mm. on top of having lost a bunch of upper body mass from mountain biking. I was like, as a teenager, I was downhill mountain biking. I was rock climbing. When I graduated high school, I was 185 pounds, which I don't even weigh that much right now, <laughs> uh, but it was all upper body. You know, I had good shoulders. I was strong. I could hang on to a mountain bike. <laughs> um, but, and that all went away as soon as I started doing hundred mile road rides constantly. So I, I rode that wave for the first three, four years of my career. Um, I was used to being skinny. I was used to being lightweight and, and having a high level muscularity and that slowly dwindled and it, I made it work for me because I actually got a little bit fitter and I got a lot more endurance. So I was able to be a better road racer as my, those first couple years of my career progressed. But at some point I had to like, like back off of that. I had, I was racing in 04, 05 at like a couple races, 152 pounds. Like, wow. Like even thinking about that right now, like I don't know how that would be physically possible without like some major metabolic reformation. <laughs> like, like I, I don't know how that even was a thing. And and so I, I, I ended up still being a really good climber. And, and then would, as soon as we got over a climb, I would just suffer. Like I couldn't, like it was, I left everything. I had to leave everything out there to get to the top of the climb. And, and then I would like follow the wheels in and I couldn't sprint. And so I'd make the front group at some big races, which was great when you're young. You know, it's my first opportunity racing in the front group. But, you know, there, there was a big difference in the way I was used to racing or thinking of myself as racing. And it took me a couple of years to figure that out. Mm. The thing that happened that I can point to is I got a knee injury over the winter. I couldn't ride for like a solid two months. And for me, that, that was a lot. That was a lot of time off of going to PT and I could spin for 45 minutes and my knee would fire up again and I'd limp home and that was hard <clears throat> and during that time period I figured out that like and I always would do this I would balloon out I would gain weight back to my normal weight my like this happy medium weight that I could weigh about 165 to 170 pounds and I would go get tested and I'd still have like 4% body fat 
it's not like I was like ballooning out and actually getting fat. Like I was still super fit and had a good degree of muscularity. It would just like, actually, I'd, I'd actually be what I was supposed to be. Mm. And, and so I ended up once I solved kind of solved my knee problem and got back into training, it's like, I can't try to get fit and get light at the same time. I'm just going to get fit. I'm going to ride as hard as I can. I'm going to fuel myself and not worry about the weight loss part of my normal routine. I'm just going to fuel my workouts, be calorically neutral. And, and as soon as I made that decision, my training went through the roof. My muscularity stayed on. My power was like so much higher. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my first race, this was in 07 tour California. And I got third in the prologue and again, yeah. like, yeah, like, like this, this might actually work. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a, so that's the, a big pivot from the typical mindset of a cyclist in the sense that like, because like in the end, yes, it does come down to power to weight, but many times when we focus on dropping that weight, we just handicap ourselves in terms of power so much so that it, that it ends up affecting our performance much more adversely than we think. Right. Um, Absolutely. So and was that hard at all? Like just with the social pressure that exists around that, was that hard to kind of push against in the sense that, yeah, you weighed more, but you were racing better. So the, the other thing, there's a couple other things that happened during that time period. Um, I was like sick and tired of putting up with my old team. So I got a new team. I had a new contract and I was like, that totally boosted my motivation. I was like, yes, like turning a page, we're pregnant with my daughter this year. Like we're, I'm going to make this work for me. It's going to be the new beginning. Like this is, I got to work harder and be better and have a knee injury in the middle of that, mm. like was super frustrating. So I needed to kind of pick myself back up and get back fast as possible. I had the right headspace to do that. It's not like I was picking myself back up into the same situation that may or may not have been a good place for me. Like what if, yeah, if I had the same contract and was racing for the same team and feeling kind of stagnant, like I certainly wouldn't have worked that hard to get there. Mm. That's for sure. I was also um, training with on the track a bunch. And so that was also, I had been seeing benefits from that as well for working on my muscularity anyway. So I had, already a certain amount of, um, of added muscularity that I knew I didn't want to get rid of. And so I, at the beginning, I was kind of attributing it to some track racing and then realizing that like actually just having the weight on and leaving it there is going to make a huge difference. Cause I started riding all my local climbs here and feeling like I'm suffering and I'm getting to the top two minutes faster, but I'm also, as soon as I catch my breath, like, Hey, I could do it again. It's like, not, not, you know, just get there. It's like, there's something left in the tank. And then I go to team camp and like brand new team again, new bikes, great new people. And, and I end up riding really well, you know, that, like these things kind of snowball on top of each other. It's not like the weight decision was one was one big part of it, but there's all these other factors that kept my head on straight during the whole thing. And I think that's just as important to realize that having your head pointed in the right direction can pull yourself out of any pit that you can find yourself in. Like it, getting your head on and your, your thought process is... I, I still think that's the key part, the key component to this. I want to rephrase this. Like in it, a, uh, sorry, go ahead, Amber. I was just going to say, I think that you bring up a really good point too, that it's, it's never just one thing, right? I, right. I think 
sometimes people think like, oh, I just need to figure this one thing out. I just need to figure out my diet or I just need to figure out my, the right bike or the right coach or whatever it is. And it's never just one thing. And a key component of that was, was shifting your support network with your team and the new contract and, and how much that contributed not only to your motivation, but then that plays into like, when you ride well, then you feel confident and you have that support around you. I, I, I like that point a lot. Cause I think that we forget sometimes um, how multifaceted our lives just naturally are. And it's so easy to just think that, oh, if I just fix this one thing in my life, everything else is going to be better. And it's, it's it usually doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Like you mentioned, Ben, in the sense that, you know, when you're paid, to make sure that your performance is good on a bike, it can be really hard, right, Amber, in that regard, in terms of trying to f like just change that one thing to make it all, you know, there's a lot of mental stress, in other words, that comes with the, the whole concept of your performance on a bicycle, because so many things go into it, you know, becoming what you're paid for. That's tough, for sure. Uh, w one thing I want to rephrase this, Ben, in another way is, is effectively, um, you, you weighed more, but you fueled your training as a result, your performance increased. Um, and as a result, you were also in a better headspace. It, it, would that be an accurate way to kind of sum it up? 100%. Like I, I felt like I was actually doing things right for the first time. It was, it was like a big epiphany for me, you know, on, on top of, you know, looking forward to the new season, I, I, I really had to figure out why I was riding so much better. And, <laughs> <laughs> it, which was like a great problem to have. Like, Oh, what's this formula? How can I, like, how can I figure this out so I can replicate it down the road? And once I started having the best year of my career, like, okay, now I really need to replicate this and put this back together. Um, it, it, it made a huge difference in, um, in the people in this new situation were just as appreciative of me as at a, at a new weight, at a new power level, as everyone else in my previous situation who were saying, oh, you look so light, you look so skinny. Like no one ever told me that that wasn't, maybe not a good thing, mm. that that should, that mentality of, of lighter is better like I was fed that from like from mount, my mountain biking time that I, I always have to be lighter and like, I, I don't know why no one ever said, Hey, you should actually start riding with a little bit more power and retain some muscularity. And maybe you're going to be actually be a faster bike racer. Hmm. I don't think people actually thought that kind of stuff. I think that there, it was so ingrained that lighter is better and work on the, the KG parts of Watts per kilogram. And then I transferred to just looking at the Watts part and how can I pile on the Watts? <laughs> um, I went from riding at 365 Watts at threshold to 425 Watts at threshold. My goodness. What? Holy cow. For, for gaining, 15 pounds. That's a great equation, people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the option of putting like, and that's when you go from climbing at like, you know, 5.5 to six Watts per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And that's, that's the difference. That's the, the difference on top of that. I'm suddenly sprinting climbers at the end of races. That's a great thing that <laughs> you win a lot of races doing that. Yeah. I was That's, just going to say, how did it change the way the, the races unfolded or your, like, how did that enable you to race differently then? Like, what did that look like that change in fitness? What did that look like in terms of on the road? Yeah. So I could, I had to haul more of me up a hill and, uh, but honestly, like, it felt the same. Like, I'm just going to sit here and suffer. And some 130 pound dude is going to like lay it down. And if I can hang on, I got him at the end. I'm not worried about it. Mm. You know, it, and so I, I changed my mentality about it as well with some success, you know, breed success. I, as soon as we crested the hill and I could catch my breath, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'll start pulling through. 
yeah, I'll start attacking it in the finale. Yeah, I'll sprint. I'll wait for a sprint too. I could win this a couple of different ways. That's fine. Mm. You know, so my confidence level in my own abilities went through the roof. I wasn't worried about what would happen after the climb. Whereas before I would worry about making it to the top of the climb. And that was the end of the race for me at that point. Now it's like, I got to make it to the top of the climb and then I'm on the gravy train. Hmm. Pretty different situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amber, sorry, I interrupted you earlier. Oh, no, 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 no. I just, I, it was flowing the same direction as I was going to, I was going to take it. So all good. Uh, th can I ask you, Amber, as well, uh, being, so this is kind of like tying back to the social pressure side of things. Cause I think that it's like doubly hard in a lot of ways because there's the, the female aspect added to it in the sense that there's this social construct that's that's widely believed in the fact that women uh, need to be smaller, more petite, everything else. Mm -hmm. And then when you're a bike racer, it's like, so make that even more complex, right? Because bike racers have to be small, have to be petite. I'm doing air quotes for those that are listening on the podcast. So like you, you pushed against that grain. You're a tall athlete. And, and as a result, you simply weighed more. Did mm -hmm. you ever struggle with that? And then how did, did you have like an inflection point where you were just like, this is the athlete I am. And then did that change the way you raced? I don't think I ever had the same inflection point, but I, I think I came to the same perspective over maybe kind of a, a more gradual, um, more gradual pathway, more gradual sense of understanding. But I, I love what you're saying about that sense of power that you have and it, the goal isn't just to get to the top of the climb. The goal is to get over the climb and to have something in the tank to finish. And I think there's an interesting mentality. I think that's, it's very common, um, in the sport in general. And this was something that I would hear on group rides and, and events all over the place, which was people revere the ability to climb and mm -hmm it's fun to be able to climb and drop people on climbs. And I remember, uh, some, at one point when I was racing professionally, I said to one of my teammates who was an excellent climber, but she was one of those climbers that in order to win, she really, she had to leave everyone behind on the climb and go over the top solo. Otherwise she was vulnerable to people like you, Ben, right. <laughs> who, who had something left in the tank. And, but I was really jealous of her ability to climb. Cause that was really my weakness. And that, in somehow in the cycling culture, there's this reverence for climbing specifically. And mm. I remember saying to her how jealous I was that she could climb like that. And I wish that I could climb like that. And at the time I was kind of known to have a fast finish and be kind of a punchy sprinter. And she kind of looked at me and was like, are you nuts? Sprinters win way more, way more races than climbers do. And it was the first time that I had, it's the first time that that occurred to me. And it was such an, it kind of blew my mind that it was such an obvious thing. And yet we're steeped in this culture. That's like, doesn't matter how light you are lighter is better because climbing. Mm -hmm. And what I got that all the time from people that like, Oh, Oh, you're, you're climbing so well. It's like, actually, I don't do climbing workouts. Like I do all my stuff on flat ground. I'm riding the farm fields. And I'm just riding the climbs like it's a flat ground, you know, but that's how I knew I was fit was I'd start going on the climbs around here in Santa Cruz. And I'd be like, I'm still in the same gears on the flat ground. This is great. And, <laughs> and it took a while. I like, put that together. Like that's actually like a pretty rare thing to mm -hmm. just feel like you're riding on flat ground, like in the drops on a climb you know, leaned over trying to get arrow because you're going so fast up a climb. It's like, that's not a normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> something to, something to add to this too. A lot of the time, the reason that we focus on climbing is because the consequences tend to be more severe. So then as a result, like, uh, that tends to be where the major, uh, major shift points in a race happen, right? Where we see riders go ahead and riders go back, but more often than not, it's less about what KG on the climb and it's more about what's happened leading up to that climb. And when you have a higher threshold and when you've been training your muscular endurance more with being able to put out long, consistent, steady efforts, that sort of stuff, the, everything before that climb is relatively easy compared to what it would be otherwise. If you've, you know, starved yourself and driven yourself down on the weight side of the equation so much. So many times, even though it seems like you're bad at climbing and I'm saying that in air quotes, 
you're probably not as bad at climbing. It's just if you shored up the other side of things and have more power, then you'd find that actually you probably don't get detached on the climbs as much as you think. It's really just a, about everything else that kind of builds up to it. Uh, ben, something that I want to hit on with this though is that uh, like thereafter in your career, you changed in many cases how you raced and everything else. And this, and was it, were you more successful thereafter than you were before? And did that just last? Was that just the rest of your career? Um, I was more consistent. So before I had like little flashes of, I would, you know, get a third in a prologue here, or I'd have a good time trial there. Or I'd have one good climb. And afterwards I was like always there and thereabouts and would be threatening to win and, you know, would, would be able to put it together at, at the end of a race. If I was there at the end, I was much more dangerous um, and would be in the, the finale instead of like hanging on the coattails. So the way that I was racing after the last climb to get there um, was totally different. Um, mm -hmm. I, it actually really helped me before of like that suffering to the finish line because I, I learned how to still race in that frame of mind. It made me appreciate how good I felt mm. afterwards of, you know, you know uh, I can, I can point to, um, winning some KOM jerseys at high altitude in Utah. And like, I would have to go make the breakaway, which I got pretty good at as well. And then I'd have to sprint Colombians at the top of a climb. That's, <laughs> That's I, I don't recommend trying that. Um, <laughs> but Colombians are one really good at altitude, really small, and they put out a ton of power and they have no qualms about laying it down at the top of a hill. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've had some Colombian teammates who are just insane. They're so good at climbing. It comes so naturally to them. And so to try to go up against that in my head, I knew I probably had a good chance and I just had to rely on, I probably have a higher maximum burst power than he does. So I need to time it right and be able to sit there and suffer and suffer and have them go and chuck it in the big ring on some steep climbs. Like, okay, I, I can suffer. I can do this and still be able to enact my plan. Um, that was the big lessons I learned before that I was able to carry over into a consistent career for the rest of the time. Mm. And uh, I would say actually that consistency was 07 to 2011. Um, uh, after that, I, my, my career changed again um, and had a kind of a different focus towards the end. I was like the elder statesman. I was the captain on the road. Um, I, I had to, again, I had a good tactical awareness of the race. And so I, my job on the road was then to use that. Um, you know, I had flashes of brilliance. I'd win a time trial and win a GC here and there, but I would always be there to help set up the sprint train or help set up the GC guys. And we had some young climbers and I would just unleash them at the bottom of a climb and I could pedal easy like and then he wins and like yay it's great i don't have to do it myself like it's <laughs> also a great feeling like when you're all my teamwork counted and but i don't have to be the go-to guy like i was a go-to guy for a long time and still had opportunities for myself but it was very satisfying to win as a team towards the end of my career as well yeah i'd actually i look at some of those wins as just as important as some of my own personal wins. I could see that for sure. Like it's because part of it too, is all the experience you've accumulated over those years was going into it. So it was like a new focused or a new skill set that you were able to leverage in a cool way, you know, to be able to, to bring about success for a whole team like that. It's gotta be pretty cool. I mean, that's really, that was your role as well. Amber is a domestique and and, and kind of running that role. Did, did you ever serve as like the, the road captain and stuff as well, Amber? Yeah, and same toward the end of my career. And Ben, I'm getting all the feels as you're talking about that because <laughs> I totally, I'm right there with you. It's when, when you can help set up a teammate to win and it's 
the win is the result of just this beautiful execution. There is, oh, there's just no better feeling, even if it's not you on the podium, even if you were, you know, kind of the, the one in the background helping make sure that people are in the right places, doing the right things at the right times. It's, um, it's a really special feeling. And it's, it's one where I, I really, I would love to see more teams out on the road because it's such a truly fulfilling component of, of road cycling in particular, I think. I think also I was at the receiving end of that for so much like, <laughs> like selling out for me. And then I have to back it up. There's a lot of pressure in that situation yeah. and, and to come through with that and win the race or get on the podium and have a good climb. Like they're just as happy and I've seen that. And so mm -hmm. to actually feel that and kind of pay that forward, I think that's a key part of road cycling and cycling in general is that social component. Yeah. You know, I, I've been on teams with good riders and good people who are terrible teammates. <laughs> and like, and yeah, we never, like we're hanging out at the motel. It's great. We're having fun. And then we go to the race and we cannot get our shit together. And <laughs> it's like, and we suck. Like, how do we, how are we not gelling? How do we, and it's this, it's a intangible that you have to create and everyone has to be a big part of it. And on Bissell, we really had that. On Jameis, we really had that. And I just, I relish those races because again, it's, it's not about that, that one race. It's about how many times can we put it together? And yeah, so I can win three times a year, but we as a team can win dozens of times a year. It doesn't matter who wins, we win. Yeah. And yeah. if you change your mentality about that, like it's so satisfying. Yeah. You know, I had JJ Haido, like one of the best sprinters in the world as my teammate for the last three years of my career. And like one, what an amazing guy and super humble, you know, like won stages of the Vuelta. And it like, is that good? It's like, yeah, I'm going to lead you all the way out. Like, <laughs> and, and to be the last guy, lead the entire bunch around the last corner and just watch the magic happen. That is so satisfying. Like it, when you have good people, like, it makes you want to go farther. And again, it's back to motivation. Like how, how can we get this job done? And when you have faith in your people and they have faith in you to get the job done and it all clicks, like that's an amazing feeling. Yeah. So true. And there's the snow there that intangible is so hard to pin down, but it, it, the snowball effect, because when you are surrounded by teammates that, you know, will never, ever give less than a hundred percent, you absolutely find levels of strength that you did not know you had because you are not going to be the person that gives 99%. It's mm -hmm. just not going to happen. And in that way, you just, as a team, you level up and you raise each other's levels and it's not, um, it's not a harsh accounting. It's not like, oh, you better do this. It's a, it's a truly intrinsic sense of appreciation for the hundred percent that everybody is giving. And then a genuine and internal motivation to then also be giving as much. It's, it's this, magic. It's the perfect balance between that giving everything for your team and also being satisfied with everything that you put out there. Yeah. Like, if, like I was saying before, like if you show up with your A game and you do everything right as best you can, the result almost doesn't matter. The wins are great for a pro team, but if you know you did your best and your teammates did your best and you guys did everything together with better synergy than you could have done it on your own, like that's a great feeling. And whether it's you know, for a bunch finish or you just put your teammate in a great position, they started the climb in the, the optimal place and then they can have whatever climb they can have and they put their best out there but mm -hmm. you but you, everyone can raise their levels and i i certainly agree with that yeah it's so good <laughs> i, I want to ask from the captain's perspective so there are two schools of thoughts on the thoughts uh, well on this sort of a thing how did you motivate other athletes that were on your team or did, was it simply finding the teammates that didn't need to have additional motivation given to them? Because that's like motivation wanes 
you know, and, and it, and it shifts and it evolves even on a large scale and also on a day-to-day -day scale for these athletes. So did you find any, first of all, did you have to motivate riders, but also did you find anything that was more effective at helping motivate people on your team? Um, first it's realistic expectations. You know, if, if you know, your guys are good and then they're firing and we're gelling as a team, I have faith in my guys, hundred percent. And I know they're going to give their all. And if it's for a five K pull or a four K pull, that's everything they got. And as long as I know I'm getting that, that's great. Also leading by example is a huge thing. Like, I, I show them, I'm not asking them for anything more than what I'm giving myself. So, and again, that's also part of the team process that I'm, I'm not going to yell at them and then like not do exactly what needs to be done myself, you know? Um, it, it, you, you, it, it's all interwoven together. Like, so the thing is like, there's your, your other point that can, can I select guys that are better suited for it? Like, that's not really my place. That's what the team director does when they hire guys at the beginning of the year. And fortunately I had some team directors that did that, but I can, there was um tour of Utah. There was a team time trial um, on a car race track and we had this new guy um, on Bissell, he was a guest rider. He was a cross country skier, super fit, hmm. maybe cat three level tactics. Didn't really know he were giving him a shot at altitude and he was a good climber. He could like, you unleash him and he's going to be able to climb. But we had this team time trial and we're like, like, we know you're strong. Just like, we all like sat down and gave him a big pep talk. Cause we had done a bunch of team time trialing before. And, you know, he totally stepped up to the plate. Like he just listened and man, he executed. We got fourth on that day against pro teams. Hmm. Now, that, that was a, actually well, like a really good result that we can point to as a team. And we did it with <clears throat> these guys who were like not used to it. And so I think that has a lot to do with, as a, how we set up as a team and like really work together for that. And also me and Chris Baldwin and some of the stronger guys definitely overcompensated. Like I could see him getting ragged. It's like, I'm going to take one huge pull here and he's going to sit in for an extra minute. And then he lasted for the rest of the race. Mm -hmm. Like it, like also like being able to really read the situation as it's progressing, as I'm still doing 65 K an hour, in the biggest gear on my time trial bike, like reading my guys as I'm going through the line. Like that's, a, that's, I think what a leader does is still have their wits about them. Mm -hmm. Like this whole thing is like, you know, chess at, at anaerobic threshold, right? <laughs> you still be able to think. Like er everyone can pedal hard. Like what else do you bring to the table? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you got to be able to think critically about what exactly is going on and not be surprised by, Oh, where'd he go? Like, mm -hmm. like if that, if you're doing that, you're not doing your job right as a team captain. Mm. Right. I think that's a great point. Cause not everybody is going to ha is going to be at their own hundred percent, but the point is that they give a hundred percent of what they have on the day. Mm -hmm. And then when you as a team captain and, and as the team culture is such a huge part of it that lifts people up, but then also as a team captain is recognizing that like, sometimes people have an off day and sometimes the most motivating thing you can do is give them purpose. That's going to meet them where they are. That gives them the opportunity to give a hundred percent of what they have that day in a way that's contributing to the team effort. And, and then knowing that probably some point down the road, you're going to have an off day too, and they're going to be able to do the same for you. But the, the key component there, I think is the trust that if somebody's having an off day, they're still going to give a hundred percent of what they have. And there isn't this sense of like, oh, you were just loafing back there or you weren't going as hard as you can. Um, that element of trust and faith in each other, I think is so foundational. And that's as much as, it's as, as much to do with the team captain's leadership and then also that intangible team culture. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. That's one thing, just really, uh, on the intangible team culture side of things. I think that's why Cliff Bar, we have them on the podcast all the time, uh, the Cliff Bar t- uh, team, and they're the crit team we talk about. I think that's their largest strength is the team culture and dynamic that they have and the trust that they have in the relationship as a team. And it's kind of like, you know, a, a family, right? Like what they have, like, it's still a team, like the, the best riders are the ones that get sent to the races, right? It's still a team, but the team itself also has like that family relationship that really allows them to be connected to each other in such a way to number one, be honest on expectations and set those and, and then also then follow through in the race and, you know, whether that's the motivation you need to be able to fulfill what you need to do, or whether it's the, the relationship that's necessary to be able to have the sort of humility that you need to have to say, Hey, I'm actually not going to be able to follow through like I plan to. And then, you know, developing that on the fly. So it's, it's much more than just a lot of people with matching Watt KGs that just happen to be able to ride together perfectly. You know, it's, it's way more than that. (laughs) Like I said, you can put together some athletes who like on paper look great, but if they don't gel, you don't have a team. Mm-hmm. This is probably hey. why the th- team thunder and honey for Cape Epic, which you may not know, Ben, but I'm not doing Cape Epic, but then, uh, Brandon, Pete, Nate, and Amber, all from the company here, they're doing it as teams of two against each other. And, and Pete and Chad just have, they have that relationship pretty strong there. So, <laughs> you know, they may end up doing better. Uh, I, I want to take a moment now to, pivot on to 2011, like you said, when your career changed, it wasn't just that you switched to that captain role, but you also had an injury that, you know, a collarbone is something that's like, uh, it's almost like a, it's like a nece- necessary thing for cyclists, like yep, broken collarbone. And these days, you know, you can get it surgery patched up super quick and you're back on the bike within a few days, even sometimes, and people can carry on, but your situation was not like that at all. Right. Right. So what you just described was my whole mentality about it. I got caught in some little nothing crash at tour California. Um, immediately knew my shoulder was broken. And like, if you got a crash, like in the race caravans, a great place, there's like a doctor and an ambulance, like right there. You don't gotta like try to fumble on your phone as you're going into shock and call someone like there. I was like, where's the race doctor? He's running towards me. And I'm like, I'm going to put myself in your custody before I go into complete <laughs> shock here. And he knew what he was doing. I actually know him pretty well. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I was like, yeah, I'm going to get surgery. Like, I'm going to be back fast. This is going to be no problem. It was my second collarbone break. So I had healed my first one myself and didn't want to go through that again. Like not being able to put on a t-shirt or ride the trainer very comfortably at all. And by all signs, surgery went great. I was back on the bike like that week, like riding the trainer. I was able to like stay relatively fit. I raced four weeks later and was able to like produce performances and race for the team and make breaks and do teamwork. So I thought it was like, like going according to plan. And it, you know, surgery sites are sore and, but it never like stopped hurting after like two months and then three months. I was like, that's weird. And one morning after, after the season was over, I raced USA pro challenge, suffered the whole way. Like I couldn't like get into my back pocket. I was like, this shoulder sucks. Like what's going on when I'm done racing, I'll go and, talk, talk to the orthopedist and the morning of my orthopedic appointment, I like rolled over in bed and left my shoulder on the sheets. Like Mm -hmm. the whole thing came apart and got out my sling. (laughs) I I had the appointment in like two hours. I was like, Oh, we're just going to go to the doctor and (laughs) rolled in and they took an x-ray and it was like the, the hardware is like a pin down the middle of the bone the pin and like bone on the end, like this ghosty stuff in between and like the entire bone is like disintegrated. And so I did a new surgery at this like inch and a half bone allograft put in and tested positive for a massive staph infection. Mm. And 
like that's the risk of getting surgery that I never even contemplated. I didn't think that that was like on my list of things. Um, as I was like, like you said, no big deal. You just get the surgery and then you're back to normal. It's like I did, I have not gone back to normal since 2011. I'll tell you that right now. What happened then was, uh, eight weeks of hardcore antibiotics. Like my hair was falling out. My skin was sloughing off. Like wow. my gut would shut down. Like every, my body was dead. Like I had a traveling nurse coming twice a week to test my blood for kidney failure. Like that's the medicine they were putting in me. Mm. And I was on antibiotics for like half a year and, and it got rid of it, which is great. And then I spent, years trying to put myself back together for that. Um, it, it was a super difficult part of my life. Like one motivation wise, I was really low. It's like, why, why do I want to keep doing this? Like I almost quit mm -hmm. right then and there. It's like, I don't want to have to try to deal with this ever again. Like it just randomly crashing. Like I, again, I could do anything and get paid more than pro cycling. So I, I could just go get a job and be able to take care of my family and be home all the time. And, but would I be happy? Well, I'm not very happy right now, but like the potential happiness, like kept me stringing me along, I guess. <laughs> and, and it, it, it took a, a lot to physically get, be able to get back and race. And it was literally a year before I felt actually okay on the bike. Um, I would have these patches of like my gut would just shut down, whether I could be sitting on the couch here right now and I could feel it. I could be in the middle of a race. I could be in the middle of training and I, I would know that I'm no longer absorbing anything through my stomach. Mm. I could, I could feel it. Like as your blood sugar drops, as you start to bonk, I could feel that even as I'm eating, and drinking water, I could feel like the water sloshing around in my stomach because it's not being absorbed. And and I'd get like the the sweat chills when you're not absorbing water anymore. Mm. And and it was just it was constant. It was it, it was really hard to deal with. And and so I had like this whole I don't know if it's PTSD or just a uh, emotional reaction to, um, this situation. Uh, I would have like huge fight or flight, like, like, you know, goosebumps, like skin tingling. I need to eat food. Like my stomach's working right now. I'm, I, I gotta eat. It was like a unconscious drive to, to, to uh, the the primal brain taking over or something like that. There is survival instinct there. Mm -hmm. Totally. And and it got to the point where like I I knew that it was unhealthy and I knew there was also really nothing I could do about it. And I just had to wait. I I I recognized that it was more of like a a mental state than like something that I could physically contain or tough out or make into a, a situation that I was in control of. Mm. Um, it, because the entire process was like a roller coaster that you're waiting to get off of. There's highs and there's a lot of lows and, and you're just kind of waiting for things to get back to normal. And that was just kind of part of that process. And I think that that realization of, yeah, I hate where this is going right now, but this is, just part of the process that letting go of control over the process really helped me in the long term because that let me let go of that that need for control and that like i was saying like that stress of wanting to wanting things to be a certain way that you actually have no control over mm. so i started trying to just put myself back together as best i can and deal with the good days and the bad days and and but i like this binge eating thing i, I would never purge but like I, I would have like this 
need to just eat and eat and eat and eat. And if I got hungry, like, don't talk to me. Like, <laughs> like I would just sit there in silence because like, if I actually had to interact with a person, I would like bite their head off. And so I, I, I had enough self-control. Like I, I can't buy into this emotional reaction to being hungry and, or, and make it someone else's problem. Mm -hmm. So I would like just kind of sink into myself, which is also not that great of a emotional long-term reaction, but uh, that, that made a big difference in my performances. Um, it affected my contract. It affected my ability to perform and, and it, it affected my family. And it made like it, that was like a big, dark point in my career where you think like, like you said, things get back to normal as fast as possible. And it was the furthest from the truth, um, mm. of the actual situation. Yeah. It's hard when things go totally unscripted in that regard. Like it's funny, like, uh, <clears throat> when I lived in Chile, one of the things that they would always say is <clears throat> if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, <clears throat> forgive me. But like, it's, it's, it's funny how it, you know, for us, we always like have this very clear path of how everything's going to work and life doesn't work that way. A lot of the time and th that had to have been particularly hard. And I don't know if you had faced pressure for the, from this beforehand, uh, in your career. Cause I mean, really like up until like 2006 around there, disordered eating wasn't even anything that like uh, anybody or eating disorders weren't, they weren't even diagnosed to men, uh, right. at that point, it was seen as like a female condition. Uh, it, which is crazy to think of. Um, so, but, you know, getting into like, you know, 2011, when this happened, I'm sure you had faced pressure. Like we talked about being light to be that climber, everything else in terms of eating, but that had to have been extremely difficult. Like, you know, if you're an accountant, it's, it's one thing, like you, you, the food doesn't play such a critical role in terms of your professional performance. However, on a bike, it is like such a key component right? It's like, no. like your food is your job and, and the, and the relationship you have with it. So just managing that relationship with food when there's so much stress on it. And then when it's, when the rules are broken basically on upon which it operates, I can't imagine how hard that must've been to have that relationship with food. That was like something that you almost like you feared even in confronting it, but then at the same time you needed it in order to get better. But it, your, your health was holding you back. How did you, how did you get to the point where you felt like you had a more healthy relationship with food? Um, I think from the very beginning, like from when I was a mountain biker, I learned how to eat healthy. Um, so I, I felt like I always had good food fundamentals. I felt like in 2007, 2006, 2007, when I gained weight, I was able to apply those fundamentals properly for the first time. Um, I mean, even if you're on a caloric deficit, you're still like trying to consume 4,000 calories a day. It's just not 5,000. Mm -hmm. It's still a lot of food. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Still hard to do. Healthy sources. It has to be like, you know, you, you gotta be able to digest it. You have to be able to assimilate it. So I learned, very early on, like what actually worked with my body. And then I just gave it a little bit more and reaped some huge benefits from that. Um, but, but I never really had like this, like I never had huge weight fluctuations. Um, after I started fueling myself properly, I would race at 170 and I'd be 170 in December. Mm -hmm. I like, I was super consistent all the way through and, and powerful all the way through. Like I never had to like, oh, I got to, I'm feeling super weak right now. I'd feel a little bit, you know, I, my endurance was lacking. I'd ride for two weeks and I could jump in multiple hundred mile days again because I was constantly fueling myself. And that was a key component um, in my training process. And, and I, it was something again, that I learned very early on of, of you got to eat not for today, not for tomorrow, but for what you're doing three days from now. And that you're, you're training so much, you're racing so much that you have to 
if you have a light day today, now's your day to catch up, you know, like criterium day in a stage race. Like, yeah, I'm not, there's not actually much pedaling going on, but there's a huge mountain day the next day. Like I'm not eating for crit day. I'm eating for mountain day. Mm. Cause that's going to be five hours of just banging my head against the wall. And do I want to feel empty then? Absolutely not. Mm. Um, so to have that whole, like, that whole component of my training that I took for granted. And, and that, that's the thing, like all of these um, multiple directions that you come, that you, um, these components that fit together for good training, you know, eating right, sleeping right, actually getting good training, getting your muscles taken care of. Um, all of these things that after you do them for a long time, it becomes very second nature. And you start paying attention to other stuff like the great view at the top of the mountain that you just sprinted up, but you don't even notice that because you have a great view. Um, that that kind of stuff made uh, taking that stuff for granted made my career work in the long term. That I knew these processes, I could trust them, mm. and so to have a huge monkey wrench thrown into that was really hard. One just mentally, like trying to figure it out again like going back to the basics and things that you don't even think about anymore, let alone try to communicate about, um, are back in play. And so I had to like go back and like read some nutrition books and figure out like, what, what am I missing? What can I get? How can I try to fix this a little bit? How I had to pay close attention. Mm. And then like the mental component of, like a, a sudden inexorable urge comes over you to like mow down as much food as possible. And it's like, do I fight this? Like mm -hmm. I, I tried a couple of times. Do I just deal with it and then go ride a ton tomorrow and try to, mm -hmm. you know, take advantage, like take advantage of the situation in the middle of a race. If it was like, it was, there was usually both at the same time. One, I'd go hunger flat in the middle of a race. And if it's a one day, I'd drop out. If it's a stage race, I'd just look for the Gruppetto. And then I would eat a ton the next day, the, that night, and absolutely suck, suffer, even if I made it through. But I, I, so also like that, that, the mentality around that, like how do I, how am I actually coping with this situation? Mm -hmm. Um was fluid at the beginning i'm like i'm still thinking like a gc writer like i gotta be there for the team i gotta <laughs> i gotta be up on gc i gotta like if i'm the guy like i'm gonna try to be the guy and then afterwards after a while of it happening it's just like i'm gonna do what i can with this mm. and try to try to deal with it as it comes and if I'm out of GC, then I'm, I'm in a different role. And uh, my team really couldn't deal with that at all. And they were hating, <laughs> hating me, hating that situation. They were, they were thinking that I was just like kind of sucking mm -hmm. or like faking it when I was good, but that was actually like normal for me. And then I would go through a bad patch right. where I couldn't actually, I, I had no energy in my system. I, I, I didn't, never thought of getting like blood tests or saying like, actually my blood glycogen is like through the floor, like, because I actually have nothing on board, mm -hmm. you know, like, like I, looking back on it now, that hindsight's great. Like it, I, I should have, would have had stuff done that could have proven what I was feeling, right. mm. but this is but I was just going to say, it's an invisible injury that you're dealing yeah. with and, and injuries that are visible where you're walking around in a cast or, you know, it's so yeah, much it's different. Like it's obvious. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then, then there's this element of respect, like, wow, look at all that stuff that you're dealing with and you're still out here racing, but the things like concussions, like hormonal mm -hmm. imbalances, like what you were experiencing is I'm sure, I mean, 
I haven't gone through the same thing, but I've had similar circumstances where you have a really bad crash or something and it's your autonomic nervous system that's driving these impulses that you have no control over. Like yeah. what you're describing is very different from somebody just having a normal craving for chocolate. Like that's not no. the same no. sensation, right? <laughs> and especially in team environments, I think it's so hard when you have an invisible injury like this because there's this element of like, they can't see it. They don't know it's there. They don't appreciate the severity of it. And it's hard to communicate that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that this is, that's an interesting point you make, because even if we don't have a team, many times we invite many other perspectives into our heads. Mm -hmm. And, and then we look at our problem from all of those different perspectives. This can be helpful in some regards, but it can also, it, it depends on which voices we lend the most credit toward and which ones we choose to not listen to. Cause I'm sure like, like you said, Ben, you're contemplating the perspective of your team. You're contemplating mm -hmm. your own very frustrated and probably dynamic perspective that you have. It's constantly mm -hmm. changing. And then you're trying to understand what you're feeling and what's actually going on inside. Like it's, it's really tough. And I bet a lot of people listening to this have something close to it. Like you mentioned, Amber, like hormonal imbalances, plenty of different things, depression, anything that we're, we, we are, trying to manage that it's really complicated and it fluctuates and it changes day to day like this. It's, it is unfortunate because it means that we can't just enjoy things on a simple plane, like we imagined them to be right. Like it's, it's another thing that we have to factor into it, but it is something that is, I think like, uh, we have to respect it we can't just, we can't just, you know, railroad the thing and just plow over it and, and push mm -hmm. through how we once were, I assume that it took you quite a way, quite a long time, Ben, to get to the point where you were back to some sort of stasis with that. Um, I, yeah, and this goes back to I, I, my thought I just had of, you, like people can have problems. It could be something as simple as stress. We yeah. all feel stress, but how do you deal with it? Bottom line, you have to know yourself and which voice are you listening to? Like your voice has to be the one that you listen to. And I had good self-possession and knew that I had good instincts and could trust myself. And that's a, I, I don't know if it's unique or it's something that I worked really hard to get to that point in my life. And I, I trusted myself and said, you you can get through this. You know, the, ways you have the tools available to you you have to be able to give it time and not and trust the process which has worked for you for so long you can't give up on the process and just like throw your hands up in the air and bail mm -hmm. um i also <laughs> when my team started really wavering on me i decided i'm getting a new team <laughs> <laughs> and and then and that part of the process is great because that gives you motivation to put yourself out there in a positive way. You're trying to like present your best self. You got to go get a couple race results. Although in that point in my career, I didn't really need them. Like I was going to be hired as a team captain where my own race results aren't really as important. It's what have I done? I, all my discussions were, how would you run this team? How would you manage the guys? Not how are you going to pedal your bike hard? Mm -hmm. um, so kind of different and interesting job interviews for that. <laughs> um, but that, that process lit the fire under me again and got me going again. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, honestly, like the change that happened in, 06, 07, I had a new contract, a new lease on life and performed incredibly my first race out. The, in 2012, I won the KOM jersey at Tour of Utah. But guess what happened? I signed my contract the day before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it, this has happened a couple of times. The, the USA Pro Challenge in Colorado, same thing. I signed a new contract the day before and I knew I was good. I knew I had trained well, but guess what disappeared? All the stress, yeah. all the worry. I was like, I'm just going to go out there and have fun. 
I'm going to race my bike because I love racing my bike, not mm -hmm. for all this other stressful stuff I've been thinking about up until this point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. guess how it worked out. Like, it, <laughs> like I, I, I was good. I'd been at an altitude training camp for six weeks. Like I knew I was good. But you, you, when you are good and motivated and just have your head on straight, it makes such a difference in life. Yeah, because yeah. again, a couple things you have all these processes that you're trusting to get there, but what do you do with it? How do you do the job with all those pieces? Or mm. are you spending everything just to get those pieces together, and you have nothing left and no motivation for the actual thing that you've been thinking about and working on? Yeah. I, I, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Um, I I think having your head on straight again and like your mentality and your motivation, your personal motivation and what drives you and makes you want to get out of bed and do the thing mm -hmm. is more important than those actual details. And shifting the circumstances in your life to support those sort of changes that you need to have, you know, yeah. and if that needs to happen for sure. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm really struck by your comment about self-possession because I think that that's huge. And the fact that when when you started dealing with this infection with the bone in 2011 two things really stand out to me one was your awareness your awareness of your body and then the second component of that is um you didn't fight your body you know in the sense that like I, I, I know for me early on in my career, the way I approached injury was very different from the way I approached injury toward mm -hmm. the end of my career. In the beginning of the career, it was just like, injury is stupid, it's just a setback. I'm gonna fight this stupid thing as hard as I can and get back as fast as I can. Whereas by the end of my career, it was like, I'm gonna trust my body to do mm -hmm. what's right by me. I'm gonna trust my body to heal this and I'm, and I think that especially when the, the healing process is not something that's really like, you can't just sit there and like think your way to a funeral. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> I would love that. We would that. all do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think so many people get injured or they have a setback and it, you know, it doesn't have to be a broken bone. It could be a really stressful event in your life mm -hmm. and you're dealing with that. And I think most people have the sense of, I should be healing faster. I should be handling this faster. I should be back to normal faster. And I don't hear that in any of what you were saying. You were very much about engaging in the process, trusting the process, trusting the tools that have worked for you, um, allowing yourself time to navigate this without, without that sense of like, oh, I'm so weak. I can't get the results I used to get. You weren't judging yourself like that. You were accepting the circumstances and allowing yourself the time and allowing your body, what it, giving your body what it needed to heal instead of trying to force some outcome that you think that you needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think also even what you said about recognizing your own processes, that's still with more hindsight, you know, mm. like we're, we're several years removed now and <laughs> kind of view these things like I, I I can look back and say yeah I had like a certain amount of self-possession about it because I have worked on that myself now for the last five years and can and now viewing it in hindsight like everything is like so much clearer when you're older <laughs> <laughs> it, it, because when you're in your 20s and you're in your 30s and you're just fighting and be, like I, I was fighting my body yeah and with no results mm -hmm. and then i just picked a new path and and it worked and i don't know why that worked i didn't know why that worked then and i think i have an idea of why that worked now um but that's just part of growing and recognizing your situation and having a certain level of self-awareness that I like it anyone at any stage in life can always benefit from more self-awareness and I, I've always felt that, so I've, I've faced those circumstances before and I've always felt that the right path forward was the right path forward, but I didn't want to take it because it didn't seem the most appealing way, whether it was b because of a lack of ease 
or a lack of just like ingenuity. Like it seems like, well, that's just such a simple solution. Like why that can't be it, right? I'm trying to solve it through all these complex ways over here. So it can't just be giving myself time and doing something, you know what I mean? Like we, we always try to overcomplicate things, but if I'm honest with myself inside, cause I, I struggled with a knee injury for like two and a half years where mm -hmm. like, and it ended up resulting in over the two and a half years, about a year of that was off a bike, just intermittent. But I kept wanting to just fight my body, like you're talking about Amber. And right. I kept wanting to fight the actual solution that I needed to do, which I've, uh, if you go onto the forum, uh, trainerroad.com slash forum, I have a thread on there called knee injuries for cyclists. And it's got like thousands of replies where people are chiming in on what they've done. Um, and I've got a full walkthrough on all the things I did to help with my knee, um, and all the different things I learned and the dead ends I found and everything else. Um, but uh, it, you know, what I actually did is neither here nor there, check the form for that. But the main goal with this that I'm trying to get at is, uh, be humble and patient when you're going through these sort of situations, uh, you probably, the, the path is if it's not there already, it's probably right around the corner and it will definitely become more apparent with more patience and humility through the whole process, rather than thinking I'm strong enough, I can just push through this, rather than thinking I need the solution right now. Like it, it's it's probably going to unfold and it's just gonna take, take some time. Um, this is like a super, a key point for all of us athletes that are listening to this because the training process does, is so far from linear, has tons of ups and downs, and we always find ourselves you know, trying to adapt to it. A couple of things I just want to share really quick on, on the point in specific of disordered eating, because I don't think we talk about it enough. Um, I, we won't go into it anymore in terms of a lot of depth here. Um, but we are going to try to make it a point. We've talked about this before, Amber, um, of, of talking about it more on the podcast. Um, it's not that we've omitted it in any way, uh, intentionally before it's just something we haven't covered. However, we think that it's prevalence is, and it's also, it's, it's, um, it operates at a level at which it isn't recognized very often. So we think that for those reasons, we should discuss it more in particular for, for male athletes, because for female athletes, it, uh, it's also very important to talk about, but it tends to be deassociated from male athletes. And, and I think that we should make sure that to normalize that and to help all of us have an open perspective. Um, NIDA is an organization it's national eating disorders.org. Um, they have really good resources on there and I can't help, um, or I, I can't recommend enough connecting with an athlete that's been through something similar. Um, however, has found a way to healthfully navigate it and asking them for their perspective and taking it as perspective, asking them for what they've done and taking it as what they've done, not necessarily what you need to do, but trying to get as many opinions like that. Cause you may end up through that Avenue, finding some sort of information that can help, um, Cause it is a very complex relationship that we all have to constantly manage in terms of our relationship with food, weight and athletic performance. It's really hard. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that for men, um, it really manifests itself differently. I think it has, it's not, um, a societal body image. It's, um, it's very self-driven, um, in my experience and in my interactions with other teammates. Um, I always get comments like, if I was just a, just a pound lighter, two pounds lighter, it's like, like this much coffee, that's, a, that, that's half of it right there. Like you're going to sweat that out. Like it halfway through the first hour of your ride. Like that's like, are, are you really thinking that that's going to make a difference? And you're also, I can see every vein in your body. Like you don't have that much more to lose. Like, like you, you have to have a, a good perspective. I think having, again, self-awareness, but reinforcing, um, voices in your network that can say, don't always say, Oh, you look so light. Oh, you look so lean, but Hey, maybe you're too light or, you know, in my experience, like I, I am eating more on this ride and I'm feeling better in hour five. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you should try that. Or like I've, I've had these conversations with um, guys that I ride with here, like they're recreational types and like, they're like, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I bring one gel and one water bottle on a ride. It's like, 
like you are going to suffer in the third hour. Like why, mm -hmm. why do you want to do that to yourself? Does, does that feel good? Do you want to feel strong the whole time? Like, look, at, look at what I have in my pocket. I have, I have four cliff bars and I'm going to eat them all. Mm -hmm. Like th this is like, try to change a perspective, try to talk, normalize. If you have healthy food habits that work for you, normalize that to people who you think you can help. Mm -hmm. And, and then honestly, there's things that are out of people's control. Um, what happened to me for a year and a half of like physical body shutting down, like that kind of stuff is like it, I tried to fight it and I tried to solve the problem myself. And, and at some point I realized like just patience and sit and wait, that's really hard for type A elite athletes. <laughs> For sure. And, but honestly, that, that tendency is the biggest thing that has also helped me in my career is letting go of the things that you don't really have control over and spending energy on things that really don't matter. Hmm. Um, that drive up your stress, that make your life harder for no reason besides that's what people do, or I can't control myself. I, I don't know. I, you can control yourself. You are in control of your situation and having that ability to see that and affect that, but not through fighting the process. That's mm -hmm. a key part. Like you don't want to sit here and fight harder for something that you think you're in control of, but you're actually not. Ben, uh, what do you, so I, uh, transitioning out of this, this has been an awesome conversation, by the way, having you both so here. Good. Um, super fun uh, and and ben and i have done some longer rides together before too and this is where the whole like impetus behind uh, the, the whole idea of having this conversation is because we thought that you would make a great podcast guest from those longer rides um um ben Check. what yeah exactly what do you uh just, so wrapping up here um what are you doing these days and then how can people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you in one way or another um i'm a stay-at-home dad I've got two teenagers. Um, I'm actually also working with my wife. She's a chiropractor. Um, she has her own chiropractic office here. So I've been doing office management. Um, we did a big re reorganization of her office, um, new um, software that drives a whole practice. Um, and honestly, just trying to enjoy myself, um, live this, um, this life where I'm looking at every day, like it's a positive, like try to it, life's hard. It, it's not like, it, it's not like it's coming naturally. Sometimes you do have to look really hard for the bright spots, but if you have a good positive outlook on life, you can at least find something that works for you on a get on a day and, and look forward to tomorrow. Um, mm. I, I've been trapped inside. So I've actually done a bunch of home remodeling. Um, <laughs> the, I'm sitting in my brand new living room here. Uh, I like, took the wall down to studs and reframed a whole bunch of windows and learned how to do drywall and <laughs> that's rad. Lots of, uh, just homemaker kind of stuff, I guess. Sweet. Um, uh, it's just new and exciting and like good detail oriented work and, stuff like that. I assume you still um, ride as well. I ride on a irregular basis with all the smoke we've been having lately. It's been like a couple of weeks. Um, I just haven't had a good day to get out. Like it's still pretty smoky out down mm -hmm. here right now. Um, and I, I have asthma, so it actually affects me pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mountain bike, try to mountain bike pretty often. It's pretty easy here. There's good mountain biking. There's pretty good gravel riding. Um, you got to climb to do it. So, uh, straight up the hill and, but you're in the forest pretty quick and, um, I can't complain about that. Awesome. Um, I'm, I've been on social media with basically Instagram. Um, I don't look at my Facebook anymore. 
Um, Same. <laughs> Try not to. Yeah, we can leave um, that conversation for another day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, Ben JM11 is awesome. my Instagram handle. Um, cool. If anyone wants to reach out and uh, has questions, um, I want to be available, give my perspective, um, and uh, tag me in anything, any trainer road posts. And I can also weigh in on those too. Sweet. Awesome. Sounds like yeah, a plan. Hearing from somebody like you, who's been through everything you've been through and still loves the bike and finds joy in the bike. I think this is folks, this is the kind of resource that you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think that having, um, this perspective has helped me, um, at, at moving past the competitive point in my career. Like I decided, I don't want to race anymore. I'm hanging up the competitive side. And that was a conscious decision that I still stand behind 100%. I did enter one race two years ago. And I it, it was like a big gravel weekend here in Santa Cruz, um, up through Big Basin and beautiful roads. I would always be riding them anyway. And it turned into like a race race. And I... You know, I, I loved every part about it except for the actual bike ride part because I got caught. I I have it in me. I got caught up in it. It's like I'm gonna. I was riding in the front group. I was feeling strong. It's like yeah, I'm gonna. I I got this. It's like no, I don't got this. Why would I think that I could do this? <laughs> <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> and, and then of course, like overextend myself and bomb. I wasn't actually very fit. And there's this crazy steep finish climb and I was like getting off and walking. And I, anyway, I enjoyed everything about it besides that. And that was a good confirmation of like, just ride for fun. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to have fun on the bike. Like that was always a big motivator, motivating factor for me. And I just got to make sure that I enjoy going out. And if I don't, then I'll do something else. There's enough house projects, <laughs> winter's coming and I get to go skiing. Like that's something that I can look forward to. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks, Ben. We appreciate it so much. And thanks everybody for joining us. If you appreciated this episode and you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up right now. That'll really help so that other cyclists can find it. Maybe they'll hear a part of this and it's exactly what they need to hear right now. Right? So it's totally worth it. So give us a thumbs up, share the podcast with other people. You can review the podcast as well on whatever one you're, whatever app you're listening to. That really helps five stars. And if not, just let us know what we need to do to earn the five stars and head over to trainerroad.com. Uh, we'll be answering your questions next week, just like normal. And you can submit them at trainerroad.com slash podcast. <clears throat> and, uh, with that, oh, and actually one other thing, this is super important. I should have led with it, man. I, I feel bad about this, but, um, on the trainer road blog right now, we actually have an exclusive interview and uh, content piece. It's just for the blog. If you go over there, it's with Andy Pruitt and Sean, one of our awesome copywriters interviewed him. It's a great piece. So it's only on our blog though. So you'll be able to go on there, read about it, but then you'll also on the blog, be able to see uh, a, a clip of the actual conversation that they had as well, uh, which is pretty great. So head over to that. It's a discussion all on bike fit with that. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Ben. That was awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. Everyone. A lot of fun. <laughs>